Well, last week, we looked at Lewis and the journey of his life. We tracked it from his time of his birth right up to the time of his death, and it's an amazing life story. There is one disappointing part in that, in that story for him personally, and that was the failure of his father uh, after Lewis was wounded in France. In fact, on his way to France as a young second lieutenant, he had to stop off in, in the airport near Belfast, uh, or in Ireland, uh, in, uh, to get one of the flights to get to, uh, to France. And he, his father knew about it, but his father did not get to the airport to say goodbye to his son, going off to France. And then his son gets wounded in France and is almost killed. And in fact, when he's standing there, his commanding officer is killed right in front of his eyes, plus another uh, soldier standing right behind him. And Lewis carried shrapnel in his body for the rest of his life. So Lewis had that terrifying experience. He writes very little about it. And you have a very hard time finding anything that Lewis says about his time, his war experience. He just doesn't write about it. He doesn't talk about it. You notice that's common of most people that have been in Normandy or have been in terrible battles. They don't talk about it. And maybe they should, but they don't. And he didn't. But when he came back after that being wounded and was in a hospital in England for from June until uh, in June until November, his father never came to visit him. And his father's just in Belfast, just across the ch a, a body of water and could get there with a ferry. And twice or three times, Lewis wrote him letters saying, I'm, I'm homesick, I'm looking forward to seeing you, and then why haven't you come? My friends here think you're a mythical creation of mine. He even makes a joke about it, but his father did not come. I read to you how Warren, his brother, said that Lewis felt that was inexcusable, the fact that his father did not visit him. And that helps to understand why Lewis did kind of adopt Mrs. Moore and her family Maureen, she was a divorced lady and her daughter Maureen, Lewis in effect moved in with them and then when Warney came back from the war, he moved in also with them and they lived together all the way until Miss Moore died. Mrs. Moore died in 1950. So Lewis, that's an interesting uh, chapter in his life, but I didn't want to leave you with that, uh, uh, with that sort of deficit uh, portrayal of Lewis and his father because they did reconcile. He felt it was inexcusable that his father did not come to visit him. And Warney says, his brother says, well, as far as I can tell, my father was a strange man, many ways, and one thing he didn't want was to anything to interrupt his regular schedule. If, if that's an excuse, it's a pretty a lame excuse. But that's about the only thing Warney, Warney can say. But Lewis did reconcile with his father, and his father uh, supported him throughout his whole time in Oxford up until 1925, when Lewis was elected as a fellow at Magdalen College and became a tutor fellow at Magdalen College. But in those years, after he got out of the uh, army, from 1920 on to, and 21 up to, to 25, he's a student at Oxford trying to get a fellowship which is the, the, the very big thing in the academic world, to get a fellowship so that then you've got a job in the university. And he's trying for several, he tries several different schools, uh, colleges at Oxford, and in philosophy and in medieval literature. And he finally gets this post in medieval literature in 1925, which he holds the rest of his time in Oxford. And then in 1955, he goes to Cambridge and has the same post, professor of medieval literature at Cambridge for the last period of his life. But his father does support him and supports him all through that period. And they develop a, a really a wonderful intellectual relationship. Remember I said that when Lewis and his brother would go back to uh, Belfast with their father, he developed a very bad habit of only talking about the weather to their father. Otherwise, he would interrupt them. And would, with his famous sentence, they would be talking about any subject, and the father would interrupt them and say, yes, I see it all clearly now, which of course he didn't. And then he would pontificate and give them a lecture, and he was a brilliant man, so he would give them a lecture from literature and other ways to answer their question that he thought they had. But it wasn't really the question they had. And so they didn't want to hear it. They were, they, they, uh, that's why they nicknamed him OAB, O Airbag, because he did this all the time. So in a way, 
now Lewis is back. He's now a young man trying to get a post at, at, at Oxford. But if you read the letters of Lewis, that uh, Walter Hooper has put all these together in this marvelous volume, uh, The Letters of C.S. Lewis, revised and enlarged edition, has all these letters. And you'll see a great number of them in the 1920s are to his father. They carry on a wonderful series of conversations, and it's not about the weather. It's about major themes. And so I do want to rehabilitate the relationship of Lewis with his father. Just to give you an example from one of those letters, it's just a wonderful letter he wrote to his father. This is 19, this is actually a letter in 1925, just before uh, he's now trying out for that post at, at, uh, at Oxford. He and his brother, and by the way, in this uh, letter, he and his brother are riding through southern, uh, this is in January now, in the motorcycle. His brother, he always refers to his brother when he writes to his dad as the colonel, because his brother was a colonel now in the, in the British Army. And he's back now, and he's got a motorcycle and has a sidecar. If you heard my lecture last week, you know, the sidecar is a big thing. I, Lewis was writing in that at a very key moment in his life. But here's one of his sidecar riding in his brother's sidecar. By the way, he got almost pneumonia after this trip because it was in January. Imagine riding in a motorcycle sidecar in southern England in January. But that's where Lewis and his brother were. And he writes to his father about that trip and does just mention in passing that I've got a dreadful uh, fever now of cold. Probably got it from his brother's sidecar uh, writing. But he's just writing to his father, and I think it's interesting. While they're on their way, they go to Salisbury, the great cathedral city. He says, Sal Salisbury is the idea of a master mind struck out at once forever, barring mechanical difficulties that might have been built in a day. Doesn't Kipling talk of the Taj Mahal as a sigh made of marble? Well, on the same metaphor, one might say that Wells is an age made into stone. And Salisbury, this great cathedral at Salisbury, he's very impressed by it. Salisbury is a petrified moment. You're already seeing Lewis, the, uh, this ability with language, it's just wonderful. He said, I'm going to call Salisbury a petrified moment moment. But what a moment. The more one looks, the more it satisfies. What impressed me most, the same thought has come into almost anyone's head in such places, was the force of mind. The thousands of tons of masonry held in place by an idea, by a religion. It's interesting, he's not a Christian now. This is in that sort of atheist, pessimistic period in his life. So he just calls it a religion. Buttress, window, acres of carving, and the very lifeblood of men's work all piled up there and gloriously useless from the side of the base utility for which alone we build now. And this is by building now, we would call it useless the way we build now. It really is typical of a change. The medieval town where the shops and the houses huddle at the foot of the cathedral and the modern city where the churches huddle between skyscraping offices and appalling stores. He hated, he, Lewis would hate malls, believe me. We had another good look at it this morning after breakfast. And uh, the plump and confident members of the feathered chapter cooling in the very porch saw a new charm. We say that Salisbury, this marvelous Salisbury, is this uh, uh, petrified moment. And then after that, uh, he, uh, he goes on and says, makes some sort of theological observations. I thought... Now, how merciful it would be if we could sometime foresee the future. How it would have carried me through many long working nights in the trenches. Now, with his father, he will talk about the war. If I could have seen myself seven years on, smoking my pipe in the oldest place in the old, safe, comfortable English fields where guns fire only at targets. But on the whole, however, it would be not be a comfortable privilege though I have no doubt at all that it was accorded to some. But like all those mysterious leaks through of something else, 
into our experience. It seems to come without rhyme or reason, indifferently, in, indifferently chosen for the trivial or the tragic occasion. I don't know why I have blundered into this subject, which may not interest you, and may put it down as a momentary eruption of that sense of irremediable ignorance and bewilderment, which is becoming every, every year more certainly my permanent reaction to things. He's now beginning to get weary of his pessimism. Remember, he called himself a pessimist and an atheist, and you can see even in that, the hints that he's getting weary of that. Then he tells about a pupil that he's tutoring. In fact, several of these letters, Lewis will mention students that he's tutoring. And he mentions this one young man, my best pupil is in great trouble. He went down the middle of last term to attend his father's deathbed. And he came up late at the beginning of this term having been detained at home while his mother was operated on for cancer. To make matters worse, the poor fellow's been left very badly off by his father's death. And it was even doubted last term whether he'd be able to go on and finish his course. And he just noticed how he notices this young man he's tutoring. One feels very helpless in coming continually into contact with such a case. If I were an older man, or again, if I were his contemporary, I might be able to convey some sense of sympathy. But the slight difference in age, see, he's just a couple years older. He's just, but he's been through the war, and he's now a young, trying to become a tutor. He's not a tutor yet. He's, he's just taking private students and tutoring them. He's not a fellow at Oxford yet. So there's just a slight difference in age. Or some, it may be, it might be, he, let me read that line again. I might be able to convey some sense of sympathy if I was the same age or if I was older. But the slight difference in age or some defect in myself makes, an ins, makes it an insurmountable barrier. And I can only feel how trivial or external and even very impertinent my philosophy must seem to him at such a moment. It's interesting, isn't it? He realizes that the pessimism he has, his atheism, is in no way able to speak to this man's needs, this man who's going through these hard times. So I just thought I would read that to show you that Lewis is carrying on in-depth conversations with his father in writing. And fortunately, Walter Hooper has saved all those in this collection of the letters. And I'll read just one more example. Uh, the, uh, uh, I will read this. Uh, in 1925, Mr. Lewis recorded the following incident in his diary. While I was waiting for dinner, Mary came into the study and said, the post office is on the phone. I went to it. A telegram for you. I read it. Elected fellow, Madeline. Jack, thank you. I went up to his room and I burst into tears of joy. I knelt down and thanked God with a full heart. My prayers have been heard and answered. So there you have the father who's been supporting him all this time. And, uh, and now there is a sense of reconciliation. And, uh, and I just thought you needed to hear that. One last uh, reading about his father. Uh, in 1929, his father died. After a, a fairly short illness, Lewis went uh, to try to be with him several times during the illness. So did his brother, uh, Warren. And then uh, Lewis was there just a few days before he died. And then, of course, they both uh, attended to his funeral and all the rest. He says, I, he says one of the best things uh, our father ever said before I left, four days before his death, as I came in, the day nurse said, I've been telling Mr. Lewis that he's exactly like my father. And then Pappy says, and how am I like your father? And the nurse, why, he's a pessimist. And then Pappy, after a pause, I suppose he has several daughters. <laughs> and then Lewis makes this great comment about his father. As time goes on, the thing that emerges is that whatever else he was, he was a terrific personality. You remember Johnson is dead, let's go on to the next. There is none. No man can be said to put you in a mind of Johnson. That's from the Johnson Boswell letters. How he filled a room, 
how hard it was to realize that physically he was not a very big man. Our whole world, our whole world was either in direct or indirect testimony to the same effect. Take away from our conversation all that is imitation or parody, <laughs> all the, the jokes they made about their father, which then he puts in parenthesis, is the sincerest witness in this world, and then how little is left. The way we enjoyed going to Leeboro, that was their house, and the way we hated it. And the way we enjoyed hating it, because the father would sit them down and uh, he would make them go to church, and then he would say to his brother in the church, are you not going to wear your coat to go up to the communion, are you? Because it was freezing cold in the cathedral. And so he made Warren take his coat off to go up to the, as if it would be irreverent to go up into the communion with his coat on. He says, you're not going to do that, are you? And so he, the father had all those curious ways about him. So the way we hated and the way we enjoyed hating it. Uh, it is as one says, one cannot grasp that that's over. And now you can do anything on earth you care to do in the study at midday or on Sunday. And it's beastly. It's interesting. Uh, the father had left this great imprint on his life, and he pays tribute to it at the end. He was a terrific personality. Now tonight, I want to ask the question, why is C.S. Lewis and what he wrote, why is he so unforgettable as a writer? And... I want, to, I want to first, in a sense, sort of analyze Lewis as a writer and show you, letting him speak for himself, why he's such a good writer. First, he uses short, clear sentences. Very few words, none wasted. He tells you just enough, but he doesn't tell you too much. And that sort of short sentence ability to write in the short sentences and to say exactly what he meant and know the meaning of the words he's using, that is a mark of Lewis. And as a matter of fact, uh, Lewis gave that very advice to a young, he, you know, he answered all letters he got. Uh, he felt as a Christian that was his responsibility was to answer the letters he received from everybody that wrote him a letter. And so school children would write letters to him, would send examples of their schoolwork, and Lewis would answer them. And here is one youngster who sent uh, some things she had written and asked some questions, and Lewis answers them. And then after he answers her questions, which are in these letters, he then makes some specific advice to this young schoolgirl. The girl is a, a girl from, uh, who, who wrote this letter in 1956. He said, what really matters is this. Always try to use the language so as to make quite clear what you mean and make sure your sentence couldn't mean anything else. Two, always prefer the plain, direct word to the long, vague one. Don't implement promises. Keep them. Three, never use abstract nouns when concrete ones will do. If you mean more people died, don't say mortality rose. Three, four, in writing, don't use adjectives which merely tell us how you want us to feel about the thing you're describing. I mean, instead of telling us that a thing was terrible, describe it so that we'll be, we'll be terrified. Don't say it was delightful. Make us say delightful when we read your description. You see, all those words, and by the way, here are some of Lewis's uh, collection of words he hated. All those words, horrifying, wonderful, hideous, and the word he uh, despised most of all, exquisite, are only like saying to your reader, please, will you do my job for me? And then his last piece of advice to this girl is, don't use words too big for the subject. Don't say infinitely when you mean very. Otherwise, you'll have no word left when you want to talk about something really infinite. So this is the kind of advice Lewis gives. He lived it out. He wrote in simple, straightforward, direct sentences. 
saying what he meant, not too much and not too little. I'll give you an example from his introduction to screw tape letters, one of his classic books. In fact, New York Times called it the finest piece of religious satire of the 20th century when it was published in 1940. And he, uh, he uh, in the opening of this book, he uh, writes a preface to the book that is just an example of this kind of clear writing. Listen to what he says. This is in the preface to the book he wrote in 1940. I have no intention of explaining how the correspondence which I now offer to the public fell into my hands. You follow him? Simple. There are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence, period. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them, period. Simple? Can you follow him? They themselves are equally pleased by both errors. They hail a materialist or a magician with the same delight. So now he's given an example of the two kinds, the materialist or the magician, who are one fascinated with the devil, the other writes off the devil, doesn't even think that devils exist. The sort of script which is used in this book can be very easily obtained by anyone who has once learned the knack. But ill-disposed or excitable people who might make a bad use of it shall not learn it from me. Now that's part of the introduction to the screw tape letters. It's priceless. It's simple. It's direct. There isn't a wasted word. He doesn't tell you more than you want to know. He doesn't give into an elaborate definition of the devil or demons or anything. He just says just a few things. But that clarity, that, uh, that spareness of writing is the mark of, in my opinion, a great writer. And by the way, uh, there's another great contemporary of, of C.S. Lewis that I'm going to talk about a little bit when we get to Lewis in wartime, uh, World War II wartime and that's Winston Churchill had the same gift. Uh, he has that wonderful gift of simple, direct language. All I have to offer you is blood, sweat, and tears. Okay. And that's what he offered England uh, in the, when they sent the expeditionary force uh, that, of course, launched World War II. Okay. Uh, Lewis has that s simple ability to write with simple, short sentences. He's also a superb describer. He has the ability to describe. Now, in his descriptions, he notices details that make the narratives memorable. For example, one of his friends is uh, Harwell, and Harwell is a a friend that goes way back to the early 1920s, and they stay friends all their lives. And he takes walks. Lewis loves to take walks. And here's the description of one of the walks he took uh, with Harwell. It's a, le it's a letter he wrote to his brother, 1940. His brother is actually uh, in Burma at that time in the war, uh, in 1940, uh, with, from England. And he gets a letter from Lewis. Lewis is telling about his walks. He loved to take them. He said, next morning, leaving my great coat and suitcase in the hotel, retaining a rucksack and Mac, I climbed the steep hill to Harwood's billet, and I collected him. Now, you have to understand the English. They collect you when they come to pick you up. John Stott was my great friend, and uh, I would visit him sometimes in England. And one time, I, I remember him saying this, Earl, I'll be by to collect you at nine. And I like that. I'm trying to say that more to people. I'll collect you at nine. <laughs> Instead of pick you up, what's that supposed to mean? But I'll collect you. Hey, that's good. So he said, I collected him. And uh, I climbed a steep hill and collected him. Now, look at his descriptions. His children are now so numerous that one ceases to notice them individually. <laughs> Any more than a scuffle of piglets in a field. Notice the mixture of uh, parable and analogy, which he's also great for. A scuffle of piglets in the field, or a waddle of ducks, a few platoons of them, now he's mixing metaphors all over the place, now they're soldiers, a few, few platoons of them accompanied us for the first mile of the walk, but then they returned like tugboats 
when we were out of the harbor. Now, is that a description or is that a description of some children uh, following their dad uh, and Lewis as they starting their walk and then they went back home? And I, I don't know, it's just that Lewis's ability to describe also, he had peculiar relatives, including his father, who was peculiar. And so, therefore, a lot of funny things Lewis wrote describe his father and describe other members of the family. And his father's brothers, Lewis did not like particularly. Like he said, the, my father's brothers had all my dad's bad qualities and none of his good qualities. So, you can imagine, they were quite something to put up with. But uh, one of his favorite relatives, though, is also very strange. And that's his Aunt Lily. Uh, on his mother's side of the family, and she's on the Hamilton side, but she's also a very, very quirky lady. And there's several letters about her. He goes to her house one day to, to uh, deliver something uh, from the family to her, and the, she said she has so many cats that she had barbed wire, or she had wire, all over the front door of the house and all over the front gate in order to keep her cats in so they wouldn't get out in the street. So you had to you had to maneuver your way all through this wire, and he goes into great detail to explain that in one of his letters. But once, uh, on one occasion, 1922, his Aunt Lily came to visit him in Oxford. Aunt Lily has been here for three days and has snubbed a bookseller in Oxford, has written to the local paper, crossed swords with the vicar's wife, and started a quarrel with her landlord. Her conversation is like an old drawer, full both of rubbish and valuable things, but all thrown together in great disorder. She's still engaged on her essay, which started three years ago as a tract on the then state of women's suffrage. It's still unfinished, and now embraces a complete philosophy of the significance of heroism and maternal instinct, the nature of matter, the primal one, the value of Christianity, and the purpose of existence. That's all from Aunt Lily which is uh, quite nice uh, portrayal of, of her. But notice again the descriptive. Um, she criticized me and said what I needed for my poetry was a steeping in scientific ideas. By the way, during this period, he was writing his pessimistic poems, the Dimir poems. And fortunately for us, Aunt Lily did not like those poems. And so we owe a lot to her because she uh, criticized his poems. And so his father made a suggestion, because Lewis wanted to publish those poems, and suggested don't publish them with your own name, because if they are as bad as Aunt Lily says, then that will further damage you in your career. So Lewis took his father's advice, and his father even gave him a name to use for the publishing of that set of bad poems, which, by the way, were badly reviewed, and it's a good thing they weren't under his name. But he published them under the name of Clive. No, he didn't like that name, his own name, Clive. Clive Hamilton, his mother's maiden name. So his first book was written, Clive Hamilton. And his father is the one who said, that's the name to use, Clive Hamilton. Uh, notice his father wanted to get him away from the Lewis name. And uh, so he named it, and the book was bad. But notice, way back in 1922, his Aunt Lily is already criticizing him. And she said that, uh, what I needed for my poetry was a steeping in scientific ideas and terminology, and that many prostitutes were extraordinarily purified and Christ-like. That Plato was a Bolshevik. Evidently, she wanted to get these, him to put these into his poems, too. And that the importance of Christ could not have lain in what he said, and that Pekingese were not dogs at all, but were dwarfed lions, bred from smaller and ever smaller specimens by the Chinese through the ages immemorial and that matter was just the stop of motion, and that the cardinal error of all religions made by men was the assumption that God existed for and cared for us. So anyway, she was also a pessimist. So, uh, but then notice the last line, I left Dimer, that's that poem he's working on with her, I got away with some difficulty. So anyway, uh, that was, but again, the way he describes is just, uh, it's kind of a wonderful, whimsical way of describing, and he's very good at describing. Another example of describing is later on when he describes himself, and I love this. He writes this to his brother. This is a, one of the funny, uh, little funny things that he wrote uh, about himself, which I think is, is good. Uh, here it is, 351. 
he writes this to his brother. He says, uh, I never told you a curious thing. I have meant to include it in several letters. He wrote this in 1940, which provides a new instance of the malignity of little people. I was going into town one day, and I noticed, and I got as far as the gate when I realized that I had odd shoes on. And one was clean, and the other was dirty. Now, there was no time to go back. As it was impossible to clean the dirty one, I decided that the only way of making myself look less ridiculous was to dirty the clean one. <laughs> Now, would you have believed that this is an impossible operation? You can, of course, get mud on it, but it remains obviously a clean shoe that has had an accident <laughs> and won't look at least like a shoe that you've been walking on for several weeks. One discovers new catches and snags in life every day. So again, that's, the, uh, that's Lewis uh, you know, as, as a, 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 a writer and describer, in this case, describing himself. He writes about people, the third observation I'd like to make. He writes about people and characters in his stories in a way that we care about them. And that sense of, uh, of being able to draw us in so that we care about the people he's writing about is a great mark of Lewis as a writer. Now back to one of the letters he wrote to his father that I, I find very touching is a, lot, a letter where he's telling about a student that he is uh, tutoring, uh, giving a private, uh, in, uh, as a private tutor, to earn some money. To be, this is now written in 1923, before he's actually got his post at the university, so he has to take private students. And it's really quite interesting the way he describes this student. He said, I have recently have a youth of 18 who is trying to get a classical scholarship. I am to coach him in essay writing and English for the essay paper and general papers, which these exams always include. I fear we shall win no laurels by him. Again, this is written to his father in 1923. I questioned him about his classical reading, and our dialogue was something like this, and this is both humorous, but also notice the way he describes. Uh, well, Sandman, what Greek authors have you been reading? Sandman, cheerfully, I never can remember. Try a few names and I'll see if I can get on to any. <laughs> Myself, a little damped, have you read Euripides? Sandman, no. Uh, self, any Sophocles? Sandman, oh yes. Well, what plays of his have you read? After a pause, well, Alestis. And then self, apologetically, but isn't that by Euripides? <laughs> and then Salmon with a genial surprise of a man who finds a one pound note where he thought there was only a ten pence note. Really? Is it now? By Jove, then I have read Euripides. <laughs> <laughs> and he goes on to say how, uh, how hopeless this young man is as a student. But then at the, at the end, he says this. However, he is one of the cheeriest, healthiest, and most perfectly contented creatures I have ever met. So he's noticing. Here he's got a young man that's not going to probably pass those exams, but he's a healthy guy. And Lewis likes him, and he notices that. So you don't get this sense of, of a scholar putting down a young man who that doesn't know who Euripides is. So this is Lewis, his ability to, to describe people. And that's really one of the wonderful, uh, wonder, wonderful gifts he has, is this ability to describe. Uh, he's skillful also in creating analogies and illustrations. In the book Miracles, which he wrote in 1940, 1944, Miracles, he, uh, he creates an amazing set of analogies to make, uh, he's talking about heavyweight subject matter at this point, and it's part of his trying to make the case for Christianity, and he says, he, he writes this, 
Men are reluctant to pass over the notion of an absolute and negative deity to the living God. And I don't wonder, Lewis says. An impersonal God, well and good. A subjective God of beauty, truth, and goodness inside our own heads, better still. A formless life force surging through us, a vast power that we can tap. Sounds like new age. He wrote this in 44, though. A formless life force surging through us, a vast power that we can tap, best of all. But God himself, alive, pulling at the other end of the cord, perhaps approaching at an infinite speed, the hunter, the king, the husband, that's quite another matter. There comes a moment, and now he decides to create a, an analogy for which Lewis is famous. He, he always likes to think this way. What's something like? What's it like? And so comes this analogy. It's almost like a parable. There comes a moment when people who have been dabbling in religion, man's search for God, notice he defines what religion is, man's search for God, suddenly draw back. Supposing we really found him, we never meant it to come to that. Uh, And first, the parable he gives, though, before that. There comes a moment when the children who have been playing at burglars hush suddenly, was at a real footstep in the hall. And then he, then he gives the line, there comes a moment when people who have been dabbling in religion, man's search for God, suddenly draw back, supposing we really found him. A little bit like the children playing burglars, and they hush suddenly, was at a footstep in the hall. Supposing we really found him. We never meant it to come to that. And then Lewis, who's got, uh, got a wonderful ability at one-liners, comes up with a one-liner. He worse still, supposing he found us. And of course, that's going to be the big theme in Lewis's book, and he gets you ready for it. But he gets you ready for it with this use of analogy. The kids, the children playing burglars, hush suddenly, was that a real footstep? We never really wanted to find that. The idea of God alive at the other end, pulling at the cord. We didn't want that. Now, what if he finds us? And that's how Lewis introduces the huge theme that's going to be a big theme in miracles. And, but he does it with this analogy, this ability to have the skillful use of analogies. In this same book, Miracles, he does another, it gives you another example of that ability to create analogy. And he does it... Uh, uh, really brilliantly in, uh, in another parable. He says, this is in the chapter called The Grand Miracle. Let us suppose we possess parts of a novel or a symphony. Someone now brings to us a newly discovered piece of manuscript and says, this is the missing part of the work. This is the chapter on which the whole plot of the novel really turns. This is the main theme of the symphony. Now, our business would be to see whether this new passage, if admitted to the central place which the discoverer claimed for it, did actually illuminate all the parts we had already seen and, and then this is an interesting line Lewis comes up with, and pull them together, unite them, pull them together. Now, if the new passage is spurious, however attractive it looks at first glance, it would become harder and harder to reconcile with the rest of the work the longer we considered the matter. But if it were genuine, then at every fresh hearing of the music, every fresh reading of the book, we should find it settling down, making itself more at home, eliciting significance from all sorts of details in the whole work which we had hitherto neglected. Even though the new central chapter or main theme contained great difficulties in itself, we should still think it genuine, provided it continually removed difficulties elsewhere. It's interesting logic. Something like this we must do with the doctrine of the incarnation. Here, instead of a symphony, the incarnation means the coming of Jesus Christ, this God who finds us, which is the main theme of this book. Now, something like this we must do with the doctrine of the coming of Jesus Christ. Here, instead of a symphony 
or a novel. We have the whole mass of our knowledge. The credibility will depend on the extent to which the doctrine, if accepted, can illuminate and integrate that whole mass. And then he makes an interesting point. It is much less important that the doctrine itself should be fully comprehensible. Now he's providing for mystery and providing for the fact that I don't have the answer to all your questions or the doctrine itself may not have the answers to all your questions. It's interesting. Notice he's the one who's providing that. So he says, it is much less important that the doctrine itself should be fully comprehensible. It's almost quoting directly from John 1, where John says the, the word became flesh and, the, and, and in light, it comes, the light comes into the world and the world has not katalambano, has not overcome it or comprehended it or fully understood it. We don't fully understand it. And Lewis almost using that same idea that John has in the, pre, in the preface to John's gospel. Lewis now uses in a modern sense. A symphony, a novel, here's the central piece of the symphony. This will pull the symphony together. It'll make sense out of this great work. Now, it is much less important that the doctrine should itself be fully comprehensible. And then he has a parable that he borrows from G.K. Chesterton. We believe that the sun is in the sky at midday in the summer, not because we can clearly see the sun. In fact, we cannot. Have you ever thought about it? You cannot look at the sun for more than two or three seconds. Otherwise, it'll burn your retina, burn your eyes, and you'll never see anything again. So why do we believe the sun is in the sky at midday in, in summer? We believe that the sun is in the sky at midday in summer, not because we can clearly see the sun. In fact, we cannot. And then here's his one-liner again. But because we can see everything else, Jesus Christ makes sense. Did you notice in those wistful parts I read earlier where Lewis says, I can't seem to make sense out of these things that are coming in and out of my life when he saw the great cathedral and he thought about that petrified great idea. But I can't seem to, it comes in and out. Things happen and I can't figure them out. And now this is what evidently happened to Lewis as he's now sharing it. Something brought the pieces together. And so he puts it this, this way. He puts it in that analogy fashion, in, in a sort of a story. He tells a story. He's skillful at doing that. It becomes a major way in which Lewis teaches the Christian faith. Now, some big things. Lewis takes on major crisis themes. And he does that as a writer. He does it as a speaker. Let me first show you in a speech he gave. One of his great speeches he gave uh, at, actually at the St. Mary the Virgin Church in Oxford, which is the university church, at Evensong. And we know that Lewis spoke a number of times at Evensong. And great crowds came to hear him. Students came to hear him when he did an Evensong speech. The most famous, of course, in 41 was the Weight of Glory speech during the Battle of Britain. But another very important one, where the, the place was jammed with students, was in 1939, the week or the second week after the invasion of Poland by Germany, which began World War II. And Lewis gave a great speech at St. Mary the Virgin Church in Oxford and during Evensong. I'm gonna read just a few lines from that that are just amazing. Uh, it's called Learning in Wartime. And he starts out by saying, it almost starts out asking this question, how can you justify studying Latin, studying ancient history, or studying any subject, medicine, any topic? How can you justify studying when the world's at war? And when you know what's happening in Poland right now, how can you justify being here? And he answers the question by saying it's because this is your post. This is where you're posted. And you're posted here, so that's why you're here. Now figure out 
what it means to be posted here. There, a bunch of guys are in the, in the front lines, and Lewis knows about that from experience. But you're posted here. And then he justifies the fact that you're there, studying at Oxford, studying at any great university during a time of crisis. And he, he starts this way. He says, good philosophy must exist if for no other reason because bad philosophy needs to be answered. And he agrees with Churchill and agrees with the, those that realize that what was happening in Nazi Germany, what was happening with the folk philosophy of Germany was that it was bad philosophy. And it was, it was toxic. And it had to be answered. We, we know a lot about that today. Bad philosophy has to be answered with good philosophy. Listen, he goes on. The cool intellect must work not only against cool intellect on the other side, because there are very bright people that are doing scientific research on that side. So we better have some scientific research being done on this side. So cool intellect must work not only against cool intellect on the other side, but listen to this, but against the muddy mysticisms which deny intellect altogether. The, the fanaticism that doesn't even have any reason at all it makes sense except a kind of fanatical, uh, he calls it mysticisms that deny intellect altogether. Uh, most of all, he says, we need intimate knowledge of the past. Not that the past has any magic about it, but but because we cannot study the future, yet we need something to set against the present and against the future to remind us that the basic assumptions that have been quite different in different periods and much that seems certain is merely, to us now is merely a temporary fashion. A man who has lived in many places is not likely to be deceived by the local errors of his native village. The scholar who has lived in many times and is therefore in, to some degree immune from the great cataract of nonsense that pours from the present tense and the present microphone of his own age has a sense of history. And so that sense of history is the way he starts the need for learning in wartime. But then he says, in order to do this, how can you do this? And he says, uh, to, to, how do you uh, play the role at your post to learn? And then he goes on, perhaps it may be useful to mention three mental exercises which may serve as defenses against the three enemies which always war rises up against the scholar or against the person trying to think or study at this time. And then these, I think it's just brilliant. The first enemy is excitement. The tendency to think and feel about the war when we had intended to think about our work. The best defense is a recognition that in this, as in, any, in everything else, the war has not really raised up a new enemy, but has only aggravated an old one. There are always plenty of rivals to our work. We are always falling in love or quarreling or looking for jobs, or fearing to lose them, getting ill, or recovering, or following public affairs. If we let ourselves, we shall always be waiting, listen to this line, we shall always be waiting for some distraction or other to end before we can really get down to our work. And then he says this, the only people who achieve much are those who want knowledge so badly that they seek it while conditions are still unfavorable. Favorable conditions never come. There are, of course, moments when the pressure of excitement is so great that only superhuman self-control could resist it. They come both in war and in peace. Then we must just do the best we can. The second enemy is frustration. The feeling that we shall not have time to finish if I say to you that no one has time to finish, that the longest human life leaves a man or woman in any branch of learning a beginner, I shall seem to be saying something to you quite academic and quite theoretical. But you would be surprised if you knew how soon one begins to feel the shortness of the tether, of how many things, even in middle life, we have to say, no time for that. 
too late now, not for me. But nature herself forbids you to share that experience. A more Christian attitude, and now here's going to be one of the most famous lines from C.S. Lewis. Get ready for it. This is one of his famous lines. He has a few, you know. Uh, but nature herself forbids you to share that experience. A more Christian attitude, which can be attained at any age, is that of leaving the future in God's hands. We may as well, for God will certainly retain it, whether we leave it to him or not. <laughs> famous C.S. Lewis line. Never in peace or war commit your virtue or your happiness to the future. Happy work is best done by the man or woman who takes his long-term plans somewhat lightly and works from moment to moment as to the Lord. It is only our daily bread that we are encouraged to ask for. The present is the only time in which any duty can be done or grace received. Wow. And then the third enemy is fear. War threatens us with death and pain. And no man, especially no Christian who remembers Gethsemane, need try to attain a stoic indifference about these things. But we can guard against the illusions of the imagination. We think of the streets of Warsaw, and we contrast the deaths there suffered with an abstraction called life. But there is no question of death or life for any of us, only a question of this death or of that. A machine gun now or cancer 40 years later. What does war do to death? It certainly does not make it more frequent. 100% of us die. The percentage cannot be increased. It does put several deaths earlier. Wow. Yet war does do something to death. It forces us to remember it. That's vintage C.S. Lewis, but that's Lewis the speaker uh, and, and writer in 1939. In 1940, the very next year, he wrote his second big book. His first book was a mistake, probably, called Pilgrim's Regress. As soon as he became a Christian in 1931, he wrote Pilgrim's Regress. And it, it was a little bit too sophomoric. You know, it, it's true when you're a Christian, uh, be careful that you don't write too quickly or m make speeches too quickly, you know. Uh, and maybe that was the mistake of that book. But at any rate, some people, I've read the book, it's a, gr it's a good book, but it's not a great book. It's just a little bit immature, okay? But in 1940, he wrote a very mature book. And a little later when I talk about Lewis in wartime, I'm going to tell you how BBC came to Lewis to give broadcast talks, and the reason they did was that one of the editors at BBC read this book, The Problem of Pain. Right after, the again, the attack on Poland, it greatly troubled Lewis. He realized war was upon us and all, and he decided to write a book about the problem of pain. And I'm just going to read a little bit from the beginning of that book that is so amazing because it becomes a terribly important book in Lewis's, uh, in, in, the, in the, you might say, in the collection of Lewis literature. And it's interesting, isn't it? He wrote this book in 1939-40, and the same time he was writing this, one day he was in church, and he wrote to his brother, who was in the, in the army, he said, I had a strange idea in church today of a senior devil writing to a junior devil and trying to entrap a patient. And that was the screw tape letters that came out the next year, 1940, came out right after this book. And that is probably his, one of his greatest of all books. And it is interesting, isn't it, in screw tape letters, the patient is a young man in the army. And if you know that story, uh, that he's, the patient is a young army guy who's being tempted by the devil in screw tape letters. So anyway, uh, here's what he wrote in, uh, in 1940, about the problem of pain. He says, no one can say, there is, there is one, no, there's one criticism that cannot be brought against me. No one can say, he jests at scars who never felt a wound. For I have never for one moment been in a state of mind 
to which even the imagination of serious pain was less than intolerable. If any man is safe from the danger of underestimating this adversary, I am that man. I must add, too, that the only purpose of this book is to solve the intellectual problem raised by suffering. For the far higher task of teaching fortitude and patience, I was never fool enough to suppose myself qualified. Nor have I anything to offer my readers except my conviction that when pain is to be borne, a little courage helps more than much knowledge, a little human sympathy more than much courage, and the least tincture of the love of God more than all. And he wrote that in 1940, and then you'll have to read this amazing book, uh, The Problem of Pain. I may read another section from it to you tomorrow in his case for Christianity. But uh, did you notice the little tincture? If you're a Chronicle of Narnia fan, remember a little tincture was given uh, to L Lucy to share and pour it when a person had grave need. So you have, if you're a Chronicle of Narnia fan, you know that Lewis picks up a lot of ideas that he later works with. Now, at this point, uh, I want to uh, uh, come to uh, my final main big, big item that I want to uh, uh, alert you to. And that is that all great writers have certain great ideas that dominate and kind of uh, appear everywhere in what they write. And that is also true of Lewis. Lewis has some great themes. Uh, I used to make a joke about, uh, when I used to te uh, teach a little class on, on great ideas or on Lewis or anybody and think about myself, yourself, i say, you know, everybody has about seven or eight, if you're, if you're really a, a very, very great, you might have eight great ideas. If you're just an ordinary person, you might have two great ideas. Okay, work with those great ideas. Lewis certainly has seven or eight great ideas. And they just sort of pop up everywhere. It's true of Tolkien, too. It's true of Karl Barth. I can see these great ideas that are in Karl Barth. Great ideas. Luther had some great ideas that you can spot in Luther. And it is true in Lewis. One of the great ideas in Lewis, he identifies himself as a touchstone of reality idea. This touchstone of reality theme, I'll show you where he surfaces it, probably most brilliantly, is in Screwtape Letters. And I'll, it's chapter 13 of Screwtape Letters. He surfaces uh, the, the great idea of touchstone of reality. Let me give you the background. The patient, uh, the senior devil, is writing to the junior devil, Wormwood, and the patient is gradually slipping away from his faith and falling in with a cynical crowd of people who are drawing him away from faith toward uh, pessimism and uh, negative, uh, uh, a negative journey. And then something happens, and he has a kind of renewal and rediscovers his faith. And Screwtape, of course, uh, being a senior devil, is, is very upset at Wormwood that Wormwood was not a more competent tempter. So he starts out by saying, I'm going to have to send you a, a manual on, from the, uh, for incompetent tempters and stuff like that to uh, help you because you really made a bad mistake with this guy. Now you're blunders, he said. You made blunders with this young patient. For on the first showing, first of all, you allowed the patient to, ha to read a book he really enjoyed because he enjoyed it not in order to make clever remarks about it to his new friends. In the second place, you allowed him to take a walk to the old mill and have tea there, a walk through country he really likes, and taken alone. These happen to be things Lewis liked to do, so he puts himself there and then. Were you so ignorant as to not see the danger in this? The characteristic of pain and pleasure, pains and pleasures, is that they are unmistakably real. Now you're going to get ready. Hold your breath. You're getting ready for one of Lewis's great ideas. They're unmistakably real. And therefore, as far as they go, they give to a man or woman who feels them a touchstone of reality. And Lewis 
wants that. And he wants us to understand it. But you'll see in a minute, screw tape does not want that. Evil does not want you to have a touchstone of reality. They want you to live in an imaginary world that's not a touchstone of reality to it. Okay, now watch him. And Lewis is a man who has a great deal of imagination, so the way he puts it makes it all the more persuasive. Thus, if you had been trying to damn your man by the romantic method, by making him a, a submerge him in self-pity for imaginary distresses, you would try to protect him at all costs from any real pain. Because, of course, five minutes of a genuine toothache would reveal romantic sorrows for the nonsense they were and would unmask your whole strategy. You know, isn't that funny? Uh, five minutes of, a, of genuine toothache, he says, is a concrete pain, and romantic sorrows are not so important to you when you have real pain. Look at Foyle's war and see some of the suffering during the war. Uh, and Downton Abbey, too, you can see it, that they, they have always kind of coping with that. Real suffering, imaginary suffering. The suffering because my mother-in-law is, is, is so mean to me. Uh, I go to psychiatrists for that. And then the bombing raids hit uh, London and everybody's in a, in a, staying in the subway tubes trying to just spend the night and not get bombed and wondering if there's anything up, we go up above, is it gonna be there? And then not many of those people kept their psychiatrist appointment to talk about their mother-in-laws bothering them. It seemed, it, it seemed, it was an imaginary sorrow compared to this real concrete sorrow that they had and they faced. So Lewis is working with that now. So you, if you were trying to submit, submerge this man in imaginary distress, you would try to protect him at all costs from any real pain. Because five minutes of a genuine toothache would reveal romantic sorrows for the nonsense they were. It would, it would unmask your whole strategy. But you were trying to damn your patient by palming off vanity and irony and expensive tedium as pleasures. How can you have failed to see that a real pleasure was the last thing you ought to have let him meet? So now notice, pleasure, real pleasures are a, a touchstone of reality, and real pain is a touchstone of reality for Lewis. Didn't you foresee that it would just kill by contrast all the trumpetry which you've been so laboriously teaching him to value? And the sort of pleasure which the book and the walk gave him was the most dangerous of all. That it would peel off of his sensibility the kind of crust that you've been forming on it. It would make him feel that he was coming home, recovering himself, then comes a great line from Lewis, as a preliminary to detaching him from the enemy, which would be God in the screw tape letters, the enemy is always God, as a preliminary to detaching him from the enemy, you wanted to detach him from himself, and you had made some progress in doing so, and now it's all undone. Of course, I know the enemy also wants to detach men from themselves, but in a different way. Remember always that he really likes, uh, now here you get a, a screw tape reference to humans, he really likes the little vermin, that's what screw tape calls us, the little vermin, and he sets an absurd value on the distinctness of every one of them. And when he talks of their losing their selves, he means only abandoning the clamor of self-will. Once they've done that, he really gives them back all their personality and boasts, I'm afraid, sincerely, that when they are wholly his, they will be more themselves than ever. Wow. This, uh, this is one of Lewis's great themes. And you'll see it in uh, this touchstone of reality theme, you'll see uh, appear, he'll put it in the stories. In Silver Chair, Jill and... Uh, uh, and Jill and Eustace in Silver Chair have been called into Narnia. Eustace is standing at the edge of this great cliff, and he's been to Narnia before. The, the girl that's with him has not been to Narnia, they, but she's been mysteriously called in with him. She doesn't know anything really about Narnia, but Eustace does, and while he's standing at the edge of this cliff, he's kind of showing off, and then he himself gets a little bit dizzy because Lewis says the cliff is so high that as far down as you can see, you see clouds, and you realize that below the clouds is where the ground is, and that's how high the cliff is, and he's 
showing off a little bit. She's got vertigo, so she's worried. I mean, people have that, they kind of always worry about you standing next to the edge. So she goes to try to pull him back. He slips, she slips, and then he falls over the edge. And then a great lion is there and seems to be blowing. And there he is falling down. As far as she knows, he's, he screams and she, she's just horrified. And so she does the only thing that makes sense. She simply falls down on the ground right where she is and she starts to weep. First she says, I shouldn't have come to this place. I don't think Pole knew anything about this place himself. And he pulled me and he was showing off on the edge of the cliff and he fell off and now, and then she starts crying. And she's lying there on the ground, crying and weeping. And then Lewis, in the story, decides to put a touchstone of reality moment. He, the author, puts it in. He puts it in this way. He says, crying is all right in a way as long as it lasts. But sooner or later, you have to stop. And then you have to decide what to do. He just throws that in. What a great line. What a tremendous line. What a line about touchstone of reality. You know, crying is all right in a way. He'd never tell somebody to stop crying. But sooner or later, you have to stop. Sooner or later. And then you have to decide what to do. And then the story commences from that point. As you know, when she, wake, when she stops crying, she's very thirsty. And so that becomes a very good thing, which is also a touchstone of reality. And she goes on try to get her thirst taken care of, and then the rest of the story unfolds. In The Horse and His Boy, uh, there's a, a scene again which has the sort of same mark of Lewis. Uh, a girl named Erebus is scratched by a, a great lion. Shasta, uh, when he meets the great lion, says, well, then Erebus was scratched in the back. And did you scratch her? And then uh, Aslan, the great lion, said yes. And then Shasta says, well, why did you scratch her? And then, because we're all interested in knowing what's happening to every other person's life. And then Lewis has Aslan tell Shasta, the boy, uh, I tell no one anyone's story but their own. It's not your story. Again, it's a kind of a reality moment that there are some things you don't know and you're not going to know. I tell no one anyone's story but their own. Wow. Lewis puts those in. Uh, you have Puddle Glum, who is a character in Silver Chair. He becomes a major character in Silver Chair. He's pessimistic. And the two children are trying to find a young prince who's been captive, Prince William. And they, they meet Puddle Glum, this marsh wiggle, who is there smoking his pipe and cooking eels. And uh, he is very pessimistic when he says, well, I suppose there are, if you try if you, if you tried, tried to find Prince William, you probably couldn't find him. He's in the underneath world, we think. And there are giants you have to go by, they would have to go by to get to there. And, uh, and then finally, telling all that, he finally does let it slip out that, and we'll probably have a terrible time getting through all that. And they suddenly notice he instead, instead of saying, you're going to have a terrible time, he said, we'll have a terrible time going there. And they said, you mean you're going to go with us? Okay, I'll go. We probably won't come back alive, but I'll go with you. He's very pessimistic. But he goes down there with them, and they come and they meet the, this, the, the emerald goddess, and she's the emerald queen, and she's got a little fobble. She's convinced young Prince Relion that her, what she's waving is the real sun, and the sun above is just imaginary, and this is the real sun that she's holding there. And he's in a chair, bound in this chair, uh, except for one night, because every night he kind of has his sanity in there, then he says strange things, so that's why he's strapped to this chair. And they realize that he's captive. And she is then beginning to, to mesmerize the children as she, uh, this little bobble is going back and forth and said, this is your real son, and you're, you're lying, Aslan, what, who is he? So, he, he's an imaginary. He's not there. This is what's real. She's convincing him this is what's real. And Puddleglum, the pessimist, gets more and more outraged at it. And there's a fire there. And so he is a marsh wiggle, which means he has feet like a duck. And he, Lewis has him 
finally in his desperation because the kids are falling for this deception. They're being tempted with this deception. Much worse than uh, uh, Turkish delight is this deception because she's, she's got this incense and everything. They think this is the real sun and they're, yes, it is. It looks like a real sun. And so finally Puddle Glum can stand it no longer and he puts his foot his duck-like foot in the, in the fire, and, it's, and Lewis then has this wonderful line. He puts it in and it made a terrible smell because there's nothing worse than the smell of burnt marsh wiggle. <laughs> but that terrible smell, the pain cleared his head and the terrible smell cleared the kids' heads. And then they realize what they're, they're being tempted. And of course then, I, won't, uh, I don't want to ruin the story for you, but the Emerald Queen turns into a huge snake at that point. It was scary. But they were able to get him or her and kill him. But, you know, what happened was that the pessimist uh, put his foot in that flame. The smell of the burnt marsh wiggle and the pain, that was a touchstone of reality. It was where pain, in other words, cleared your head. And Lewis is working with these themes in a lot of his stories, and they become very important. This, the stories have that, that kind of feature. And uh, uh, it becomes a major theme in Lewis's writing. Next week, what I want to do is take you into a journey with Lewis, who makes the case for Christianity. And he does it two great ways, and we'll see it next week. He does it from the center outward and from the edges toward the center. He works both ways, from the edges to the center and from the center to the ages. To the edges. We get his great mere Christianity theme there next week, uh, where Lewis, uh, in miracles and in mere Christianity and these great books, that he wrote, uh, puts together his, uh, his case for the Christian faith. And we'll look at that. Tonight, uh, I did want to give you a little gift and uh, read you uh, Lewis as the storyteller. Because he is a storyteller. You saw it when he told about the, the kids playing burglars. But he is a storyteller. And in my opinion, the, one of the best stories he told is The Horse and His Boy. And I'm going to tell you about this story. Can you imagine, how would you feel if you were a little boy and you, were, uh, you have a, a, a stern stepfather who's been taking care of you and you're just a young teenager and uh, one of the, it's in the, in the land of Tarkan and a Tarkan officer, soldier comes and is there talking to your stepfather. And you, as a little boy, are just listening in at the edge. Who wouldn't? What in the world are they talking about? And then to your horror, as they're talking, you realize that the Tarkian officer is negotiating with your stepfather to buy you as a slave, to turn into one of his, one of his uh, workers and slaves. And, I mean, that is a terrifying thought. Talk about a, 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 uh, an abusive parent. That is an abusive parent that's going to sell you as a slave to this Tarkian soldier. And so you're very disappointed. You walk out into the stable, but then the plot thickens. In the stable, a horse speaks to you and says, if I were you, I'd make a break for it. And the horse, it turns out, was also captured. He's a Narnian horse who can talk. Remember in the Chronicles of Narnia, in Narnia, some of the animals can talk. And this horse can talk. And he says to this boy, Shasta, if I were you, I'd make a break for it. We got to get out of here. And by the way, that's why this book is called The Horse and His Boy, not The Boy and His Horse. Because the, the horse, this horse, Bree, takes the boy, the boy puts, gets on his back, and they make a break for it. Now, over in Tarkan, there's a girl named Erebus, and Erebus is a young princess, and she discovers that her parents are arranging a political marriage where she's going to marry a huge, fat prince, prince uh, in order to help make the treaties better in that part of, the, of their empire. And she doesn't want to marry that bad. He's a very uh, unappealing person to marry. And she hears about that, so she's outraged. 
But she's got a lot of ingenuity, and she gives a little uh, sleeping pill to her maid, goes out into the stable, just jumps on a random horse, but would you believe it, it's also a talking horse that had been stolen from Narnia. Isn't that, her, that horse's name Win? So she gets on that horse, and she makes a break for it. I'm going to get out of here rather than to marry that Tarkian prince. I don't want to marry him. And so she's going, and they come to a stream, and this, this a huge stream to ford, and then a lion chases both of these horses. And the horses then come together, and they meet each other, and the horses talk and say, hey, we're talking horses. Wow, we're from Narnia. And uh, we've got these two kids on our back. And they go up, and they go into a village. In the village, there's a, 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 an embassy group of Narnian, Narnian young people who have come down, young officers have come to do some negotiating because there's peace at that time between that part of the empire, Great Narnia is up there, Archenland, and here this is Tarkian. And the kids are there, and they have to be real quiet. And Shasta is, since he, he looks a lot like one of the kids that was from Narnia, he goes and spends a night in the tombs, sleeping. He's, he's a little bit scared of tombs, but he's sleeping there. There are jackals out there. There are wild animals. But a cat does sleep with him that night and kind of keeps him up. Uh, comfortable at night a little bit and then he goes back into the city joins up with Erebus and joins up with his horse and Erebus and her horse and the kids realize that Rabidash the general of the army in, Tar in Tarkan is plotting a surprise attack on King Loon and Archenland and so they realize we've got to get to King Loon and alert him to the fact that the Rabidash and his troops are going to mount a surprise attack. So the kids go with the two horses, and they're running up on the side. It must be be it'll be beautiful when they make a film of this. They're on one side. On the other side of the river, you can see all the troops of Rabidash on the other side. They're on this side, but their horses are getting tireder and tireder. Whereupon a lion appears, and Shasta becomes very courageous there because the lion scratches Erebus on the back. And Shasta turns, and he doesn't know anything about Aslan at this point. He turns and scares the lion away. Not bad, huh? And, but then they go on, and they get to the hermit's house. And when they get to the hermit's house, the kids uh, are dead tired. The horses are dead tired. Erebus has got a wound in her back. She's there at the, at the hermit's house. And then Shasta is set on by foot because the horses are too tired now. And he goes on to meet King Loon. And a little while later, he does see King Loon. And King Loon at first says, ah, core my son. He says, no, I just look like him. I'm actually Shasta. And your son is down there in, the, in town. And we discovered that Rabidash is sending troops up to do a surprise attack for you and we were sent to warn you. Okay, King Loon says, put that boy in a horse, and then they start to go back to King Loon's, uh, the great Archenland palace, to get ready for Rabidash. They know he's coming. Shasta is now on a horse that is not a horse that can really uh, know how to run, because a horse, Shasta had never been taught to use spurs, because Bree would not allow spurs. He didn't want he was leading, you know, it's the horse and his boy, not the boy and his horse. So he doesn't know how to make the horse go. And the horse is going slower and slower, and all the other horses are going on. Have you ever had that happen where you can't get your horse to go? And the horse won't go. So he gets further and further behind. And now they've all gone up, and they've left him behind. And then he can hear Rabidash coming up behind him. So he goes over onto a side, onto a side road and waits, hiding. Fortunately, Rabidash and his troops go by, and they're so proud of the fact that they're going to surprise Archenland with a surprise attack. And he's just sitting there, well, that's not going to happen because they know you're coming. He says that to himself. And, but it doesn't help him because he goes out on the trail. It's now dark. It's in the middle of the night. He's on the trail. He's got a horse that won't run doesn't know how to make it go. It's just walking along. And at, I'll pick up the story at that point. <laughs> I do think, said Shasta, that I must be the most unfortunate boy who ever lived in the whole world. Everything goes right for everyone except me. Those Narnian lords and ladies got safe away from Tashpan. I'm left behind. Erebus and Bree and Huyn are all snug as anything with the old hermit. Of course, I was the one sent on. 
King Loon and his people must have got safely into the castle. They shut the gates long before Rabidash arrives, but I got left out. And being very tired and having nothing inside of him, he felt so sorry for himself that tears rolled down his cheeks. What put a stop to it all was a sudden fright. Shasta discovered that someone or somebody was walking beside him. It was pitch dark. He could see nothing. And the thing or person was going so quietly that he could hardly hear any footfalls. What he could hear was breathing. His invisible companion seemed to breathe on a very large scale. And Shasta got the impression it was a very large creature. And he had come to notice this breathing so gradually that it owned really no idea how long it had been there. It was a horrible shock. It darted into his mind that he had heard long ago there were giants in these northern countries. He bit his lip in terror. But now that he really had something to cry about, he stopped crying. <laughs> the thing, unless it was a person, went on beside him so quietly that Shasta began to hope that he'd only imagined it. But just as he was becoming quite sure of it, there suddenly came a deep, rich sigh out of the darkness beside him. That couldn't be imagination. Anyway, he felt the hot breath of that sigh on his chilly left hand. If the horse had been any good, or if he had known how to get any good out of the horse, he would have risked everything on a breakaway with a wild gallop. But he knew he couldn't make the horse gallop. So he went on at a walking pace. The unseen companion walked and breathed beside him. At last, he could bear it no longer. Who are you? He said scarcely above a whisper. One who has waited long for you to speak, said the thing. Its voice was not loud, but very large and deep. Are you a giant? asked Shasta. You might call me a giant, said the large voice, but I'm not like the creatures you call giants. I can't see you at all, said Shasta, after staring very hard. Then an even more terrible idea came into his head. He said almost in a scream, you're not something dead, are you? Oh, please go away. What harm have I ever done you? I'm the unluckiest person in the whole world. Once more, he felt the warm breath of the thing on his hand and face. There, it said, that's not the breath of a ghost. Tell me your sorrows. Shasta was a little reassured by the breath, so he told how he had never known his real father or his mother. He had been brought up sternly by the fishermen. And then he told the story of his escape and how they were chased by lions and forced to run for their lives, swim for their lives and of all of their dangers in Tashban, and about his night among the tombs, and how the beasts howled at him out of the desert. And he told about the heat and the thirst of their desert journey, and how they were almost at their goal when another lion chased them and wounded Erebus, and also how very long it had been since he had anything to eat. I do not call you unfortunate, said the large voice. Well, don't you think it was bad luck to meet so many lions? Said Shasta. There was only one lion, said the voice. What on earth do you mean? I just told you there were at least two the first night. No, there was only one. But he was swift of foot. How do you know? I was the lion. And as Shasta gaped with open mouth and said nothing, the voice continued. I was the lion who forced you to join with Erebus. I was the cat who comforted you among the houses of the dead. I was the lion who drove the jackals from you while you slept. I was the lion who gave the horses the new strength of fear for the last mile so you would reach King Loon in time. And I was the lion who you do not remember, who pushed the boat in which you lay a child near death so that it came to rest where a man sat at the shore, wakeful at midnight to receive you. Then it was you who wounded Erebus. It was I. 
But what for? Child, said the voice, I am telling you your story, not hers. I tell no one any story but his own. Who are you? asked Shasta. Myself, said the voice, very deep and low. So the earth shook. And again, myself, loud and clear and gay. And then a third time, myself, whispered so softly, you could hardly hear it. And yet it seemed to come from all around you as if the leaves rustled with it. Shasta was no longer afraid that the voice belonged to something that would eat him or that it was the voice of a ghost, but a new and different sort of trembling came over him. Yet he felt glad to. You'll have to read the rest of the story now. <laughs> hey, I think we used up our time. Hey, God bless you. I'll see you next week, and we'll look at Lewis uh, make the case for Christian faith. Heavenly Father. <laughs> Heavenly Father, thank you for this time together. And thank you for writers like J.R. Tolkien, C.S. Lewis, Charles Williams, George MacDonald, G.K. Chesterton, people in that inkling crowd that share their faith with our generation and the next generation and the generation after us. We're so grateful. And now, Lord, may we be storytellers ourselves. And may we uh, know the great golden lion, son of the emperor from beyond the sea. We're thankful that Jesus Christ is the one who fulfills that great golden lion. So bless us and, and give us a good week. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.